Hey, folks, we just want you to know that all the views and opinions expressed on Military Historians or People Too are ours and that of our guests. They do not represent any organizations, employers, and other entities with which we and our guests may be affiliated or associated. Got it? Enjoy the show. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Military Historians or People 2. I'm Bill, and that is Brian. Say hey, Brian. Hello, everyone. Again, he's so excited. Man, it's spring break, man. You need to it is it's spring break. I should be more excited, yeah. But uh, <laughs> I got a surprise last night. My wife reminded me that our children uh, actually are out of school today because of a teacher work day. So uh, so they're home. So when I go home, I'll, I'll get to spend some quality time with with the kids oh so that's why you're so down I got no it. i'm not down you know i'm good i'm not and and the oldest one has a tennis match this afternoon so that'll be uh, oh, okay that'll, that'll be good <clears throat> yeah so good I'm, I'm i'm wearing the team colors today yeah you got your got your your statesboro is it is statesboro high with her statesboro or? high blue devils yeah yeah the blue devils wow good for her she's done yeah. well she's doing well yeah we have a very special guest uh from from the uk uh join us today uh, Martin Thomas, the University of Exeter, who Brian will interview here shortly. Uh, a couple of shout outs, one to university presses. Uh, we try to remember to, to remind everybody to support university presses wherever you're at, uh, especially our friends out in Lawrence and Kansas. Hello to everybody at the ranch. Oh, I've got a, I've got a, a special announcement, special announcement, Brian. Our podcast, Military Historians People Too, is going to have a Zazzle merch store. Yeah. We, we are going commercial with some swag, and it's the most gaudy, uh, awful, poorly designed stuff you can imagine, but check it out. We'll post the, uh, the uh, website on Twitter, and we'll put it on the pod descriptions, and any support you can offer us, you know, uh, you can even buy a guitar pick, right? And, you know, I, I think what are the with the pre-orders that we got, if you order today, it's probably going to be a couple of months before we can get called up yeah, with all yeah. the orders. No, it's it's really right. <laughs> yeah, it is. it's it's sacking up pretty quick. But no, we've got sweatshirts, T-shirts, things like that with our logo and whatnot on it. And anything you, you want to get, we can uh, you know, help us offset some of the cost of, of production, which isn't a lot, but. You know, we, we do spend some money out of our own pocket for this thing. We're not we're not trying to make a profit. Although one day, one day, one day, one day we're going to get there. Oh, and also on on the, the, the swag store is the much coveted collectible coffee mug from season one that we gave. Yes. Yeah. Before we found out that shipping those things cost way too much money, especially to the UK. Yeah, apparently it costs uh, about thirty five dollars to yeah, ship those forty dollars or something to ship those things. <laughs> so, so we went with the, the the koozie, the can koozie, which is a lot cheaper, a lot lighter, yeah. and and much more easier to ship. But those are available as well. So, yeah. Uh, but but that's all I got. You got anything? Shout out! I will tell a shout out to uh, to high school history teachers. Uh, we got an email uh, this oh, week yeah. um, from yep. from someone who was a retired teacher, and uh, they wanted us to uh, maybe not be so negative about uh, high school history teaching. And so, uh, you know, just to let everyone know, I taught at the high school level. My wife is in uh, elementary school education, so we are we are definitely big supporters of uh, of people doing the hard work at the elementary and uh, and high school level here in the United States. Um, so, uh, you know, if we've ever come across as, as being, uh, anti high school history, uh, that's, that's certainly not our, yeah, a fair, a fair cop. We got a little carried away the other day on, the, yeah. uh, maybe complaining about our own students a little, a little too much, how, how, you know, yeah. their uh, preparation, but, but it was not intended as a blanket by, by any means. Uh, no, definitely cause, not. Cause heaven knows that not all of us, uh, college level history professors are, are without, Right. Very, yeah. very true. Yep, yeah, very absolutely. true. Absolutely. All right, let's introduce our guest. All right, today we are um, we are are really fortunate to have with us Martin Thomas, uh, Professor Martin Thomas is a professor of history at, uh, and I should say, director of the Center for Histories of Violence and Conflict at the University of Exeter in the UK. He was also the first director of the university's Center for the Study of War, State, and Society. Before joining the faculty at Exeter, Martin taught at the University of 
the West of at the West of England. Is that right? The University at the West That's of England right. uh, in Bristol for 11 years. He has held visiting professorships and fellowships. And you are going to have to help me out with this one at Sciences Po Saint-Germain in Lai. Yeah. Yeah, Sciences Po Saint Germain. Yeah, where the okay. football team in. There, there you go. <laughs> uh, also uh, had a fellowship at the Netherlands Institute of Advanced Studies, and he was educated at Oxford University. Martin is the author of ten books and dozens of articles and book chapters. And uh, Martin's one of these these occasional guests we have where I really can't list off all the things that he's published because we would be here uh, for the first half hour doing so. So I'm giving you a, a selection. <laughs> he published the Oxford Handbook of the Ends of Empire with co-author Andrew Thompson in 2019. Uh, has also done Arguing About Empire, Imperial Rhetoric in Britain and France, 1882 through 1956. That one was done uh, with Oxford with co-author Richard Toy in 2017. Also did the civil civilianization of war, the changing civilian military divide, 1914 through 2014, with Andrew Barros, uh, uh, done by Cambridge in 2018. That's Reference. a good one. That's a really good one. Uh, yeah, looking through that last night, I've got to I've got to yep. check that out. Martin's solo publications include Fight or Flight, Britain, France, and Their Roads from Empire, uh, done with Oxford in 2015. Violence in the Colonial Order, Police, Workers, and Protest in the European Colonial Empires, 1918 through 1940, uh, put out by Cambridge in 2012, and The French Empire at War, 1940 through 1945, done with Manchester University Press back in 1998, and I assume that was the doctoral dissertation, is that correct? It was sort of a development of that, yeah. Okay. Martin was awarded the Philip Leverhulme Prize for Outstanding Research in 2002 and currently holds a three-year Leverhulme Trust Major Research Fellowship. He has also been a fellow of the Independent Social Research Foundation, uh, and he has been a member of the editorial boards of the International History Review, Intelligence and National Security, Diplomacy and Statecraft, War and Society, French Historical Studies, and Cambridge's Studies in the Social and Cultural History of Modern Warfare. And I want to stress once again that this is just a taste of uh, of all the things that Martin has done. We appreciate you taking the time um, in your afternoon, our midday, to, uh, to speak with us. So welcome, Martin. It's great to see you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you both. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm really flattered. Thank you. You know, you left out Brian, soldier of soldier of Fortin and Football Weekly. Uh, I think he's on the editorial boards uh, of those as well. Um, well, there's so I, I had a, a couple. I mean, when I was googling, you know, looking, stalking you last night, trying to find stuff. Um, when you Google Martin Thomas and Exeter. A bunch of stuff for the Exeter football team comes up. So apparently, there's like a part owner whose name is Martin Thomas. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. We're pretty thin. We're put, well, we're not thin on the ground. The opposite. We're all over the place, actually. There used to be a, a Martin Thomas who was a goalkeeper as well uh, okay. for a little while, at, uh, I think, at Crystal Palace several years ago. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we're common as Mark, I'm afraid. Yeah, there there's not aren't too many Brian Feltmans floating around in the world. So, so <laughs> it's hard to uh, to mistake me with anyone else. Although, interesting fact, um, the reason I started using the K uh, Brian K. Feltman is that uh, in the state of Georgia, where I live, there is another Brian Feltman, and he is a convicted murderer. He murdered his uh, his wife. And so uh, uh, if you Google Brian Feltman, Georgia, he is usually the first one that comes up. That's not me. Right. <laughs> yeah, not me. <laughs> so, all right, Martin, um, tell us where you're from. Uh, you know, what did your parents do? What kind of house did you grow up in? And uh, how did you how did you get into history? And then specifically, um, you know, what was it about French history that pulled you in? Wow, that's a, those are foundational questions, aren't they? Yeah, Brian? that's yeah. that's what we do. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'm I'm from Cornwall, so uh, I'm from the sort of the deep south of the UK, really, I guess. And uh, yeah, I grew up by the sea, um, and my folks were. Uh, teachers, really. My father was a, a history and then a politics teacher. Uh, and my mum was really a French teacher, although she uh, uh -huh. she didn't teach French all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, I had a, a, a pretty nice time, really. <laughs> so what, what town? What town? Uh, I'm from Foy, which is on the south coast of Cornwall. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. I've watched enough Escape to Escape to the Country. I know where these places. <laughs> <are>. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose in terms of becoming a history person, that was sort of in part by design, but substantially accidental, really. Why why history? Well, I guess I uh, I was just uh, attracted to it, and there was a lot of it in the air when I was growing up. We would often go to France, and uh, we had a lot of French friends with whom we'd stay, who were, were absolutely lovely. And I can remember as a kid um, being taken uh, to a farm owned by um, one family, the, the Martignon near Montluçon. And uh, the matriarch of the family said, uh, I hear you're, uh, you're into your history. And she said, would you like some of these? At which point she went to uh, the kitchen and produced several Mills grenades, oh. which <laughs> she kept in a, in a kitchen <laughs> cupboard. And she'd been involved in the resistance and uh, had kept this sort of stash for the past kind of 50 years at that point. Wow. Um, at which point my father got a little bit concerned and said, yeah, well, thanks very much, but maybe it age nine <laughs> we'll pass on that one. <laughs> uh, which was probably a good idea but uh yeah that stuck in the mind but um yeah i kind of gravitated originally towards french history i suppose because uh i spent a little while in france as a, as a kid and mum spoke french and you know got into french that way uh and increasingly i found myself being drawn ever further southwards towards the francophone world towards yeah. french africa and algeria i suppose primarily um and so my route into that originally was a, a phd which um i'd sort of arrived at almost accidentally i'd been in greece not really knowing what to do uh teaching english and had come back to uh investigate the possibilities of doing a phd and the university authorities asked me some fairly sensible basic questions like can you speak any languages and i said well i've got a bit of french uh and from that i got into thinking about the front populaire the popular front you know the, the one sort of leftist government in france between the wars and increasingly i was drawn to their colonial policies and, and this sort of manifest contradiction between, if you like, being a, a socialist and particularly perhaps a Republican socialist with that great troika of liberty, equality, fraternity, and at the same time being a colonialist. How could you how could you possibly reconcile those two positions? Right. Um, and that got me into thinking a lot about this idea of colonial humanism and I suppose what in the second half of the 20th century, we became much more used to thinking of as uh, modernization theory, really, and the idea that one could only justify imperialism, if at all, on the basis of a sort of political economy of results of right. improving living standards, et cetera, et cetera. Terribly Western centric, terribly sort of universalistic in, in its conception, but to a degree reconcilable with with socialist ideas and so i think that's that's what i got into and that just took me down the road of of empire which i've never got off really um, so uh mom had to be fairly happy that you ended up doing french history right she felt like uh some of the experiences as a child had had really shaped who you became uh that's a nice thought yeah yeah i guess <laughs> I don't know, really. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, that, my, my parents were absolutely lovely, but uh, they were quite understated, really. <laughs> but yeah, I think she was pretty happy. Yeah, good, good deal. So I um, assume growing up in Cornwall, I mean, we, we've had several guests, you know, from the UK and Europe on, and of course, you know, unlike us, uh, you know, Brian's still recovering from from being exposed to too much Civil War stuff growing up in, yeah. in South Carolina, and. But, you know, you guys, you, you in, in Cornwall, you, you trip over a copper mine or, or a castle or, or something. They're all over the place. You know, did that, 
as a kid, did that kind of attract you or, or did, was it just too ubiquitous? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. But I, I can't say I was, I was much of a local historian, to, yeah. be, to be honest. But it was all around, yeah. And uh, much later in life, actually, within the past five years or so, the Cornish people have been recognised as a kind of a, a national minority within the UK. Right. Um, there are much stronger efforts to to revitalise the Cornish language and sort of Cornish identity. Um, I am of a slightly older generation of people from Cornwall for whom, you know, Cornish as a language w was just not there and yeah. Um, yeah you know my cornishness insofar as i've got it is only really first generation so i i can't claim centuries of attachment yeah. um and i'm also from what's become as you said just now a real sort of tourist trap part of cornwall really um the area that is at the far west of cornwall west pen with right um, is really the absolute hub of the old mining districts. And it's from there that you get the mass emigrations of Cornish people in the 19th century and early 20th, particularly to places like South Australia, um, where they are also integral to mining technology as well. Um, so there are some pretty interesting global attachments and of course, there's also this very strong maritime culture. So, yeah. right. um, you know, fishing used to figure very large. Certainly the sea and, and lives on ships are and were still a big deal, I think. Um, so, you know, uh, raising money for the lifeboat is one of the things that if you're from Cornwall, you just... Oh, yeah, yeah, done. yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, right. That's a big deal. I mean, it's still a big deal. Today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So you weren't your family wasn't one of those. Uh, you know, we got to keep those people from Devon out of here, right? We've got to. <laughs> no, not really. No, <laughs> no. Um, although I did know a few people who went off to university, and then when they got across the 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 frontier, if you like, across yeah. the river, as it is just a little railway bridge, they got off the train in Plymouth and just went back again. <laughs> 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 You never know. <laughs> well, look, your 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 work on France, especially in the Second World War, you kind of alluded to it a while ago, of getting into you know colonialism and you know, how do you measure success or not? Kind of you know, obviously, it's very Western centric, but you've really gotten into a lot about counterinsurgency, that sort of thing. Uh, how how did that kind of morph is throughout your career to get get into that? Yeah, well, colonial violence is always an issue if you study colonialism. I mean, yep. for a lot of people, obviously post Fanon, but even before, um, colonialism is violence. And um, the growth of post-colonial theory and ideas of structural violence and cultural violence have really sort of made that almost a kind of received wisdom. Um, I've, I'm drawn by some of that literature, but to me, uh, there's, there's a different kind of contradiction that's always interested me really, which is that empires are pretty flimsy in a lot of ways. And the bigger the be they become, the more flimsy they become. They're quite rickety structures. They're very thinly administered. Um, and of course, you know, one is generalizing massively but the issue with empires and violence it seems to me is what happens when they turn up because for an awful lot of the time colonial administration the face if you like of of colonial governance and colonial racism is implicit in the structures of a society the way land is distributed, the way wealth is distributed, the way job opportunities play out, freedom of movement and all the rest of it. But the actual presence of somebody or a group that can coerce another group into doing what they want is often um, only expressed intermittently. In other words, 
it's when the tax collectors show up and right they typically yeah. show up with people with weapons with weapons yeah um it's when uh title to land is disputed and some sort of western style property ownership is coercively right. introduced that right. effectively dispossesses the great majority almost overnight these are the things that it seems to me are the real building blocks of colonial violence and so it's that contradiction, if you like, between a state of affairs that maybe even for 364 days of the year is not exactly peaceful, but is relatively remote from a center or a, a core of colonial administrative power. And that one day of the year when that colonial administrative power or legal power is so imminently expressed that to me is is the essence of, of what colonialism means because apart from anything else one is dealing most of the time with intensely rural societies um big places geographically diffuse culturally heterogeneous um immensely complex spaces whose rulers very often don't really have much of a sophisticated understanding of, of how these societies work, what they are, but conversely have a pretty clear idea of what they want from them and what they think should be done with them. And, well, so, you, have, and you have a you have a, a stereotype, or at least for me, a stereotype that you know you've got the, your your colonial administrations housed in in your your raffles like existence, right? You know, there, there's limited transportation networks in these places. So, you know, you go out, the tax collector or whoever, you know, it, it, it takes forever. It's it's dangerous. And, then, and so they don't go out there a lot. Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, as you guys would know really well, that there's lots of work out there on sort of sociologies of violence across right. the global south and in the colonial world, especially, and, and the way in which resistance is expressed. And those sort of weapons of the weak, as they're often characterized, yeah. you know, they, they may be technologically pretty um, basic, but in a lot of ways, it's always on the one hand, the power of numbers, but more and more, it's the power of absence. It's the power of not showing up to work. It's the power of working slow. It's the power of rejecting the discipline of of colonial time if you like you know a nine to five or more likely a, an eight to ten um waged working week yeah. these are ways in which um one can register opposition to yeah. a colonial presence uh and it's very often those sorts of things that become the flashpoints for violence so you know, I, I got very, very interested in colonial workplaces and um, what the basic difference is, if you like, between a colonial strike and a strike in metropolitan France. A lot of historians are very drawn to saying, well, the issues there are fundamentally the same. They're about rights. They're about recognition of a common citizenship, a common humanity sometimes. But it seems to me more basically, they're about an ability to resist a foreign occupying authority and how that is done. Right. So I guess my interest in colonial violence is, is in part just trying to say, well, how is that violence expressed? It's very often not expressed or, or it's only its final stage is a kind of insurgency with weapons being fired from one side to another. Um, prior to that, it's much more about resisting colonial edict. And it's that that then, you know, leads to the, the police yeah, so it's like it, the troops, etc. It's just from being passive to active. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 I'm having uh, I'm having flashbacks now of grad school and James Scott uh, foot dragging and, 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 and all that good stuff. But, but, you know, in my own work with prisoners of war, I, I used a lot of that because, you know, suddenly prisoners of war are, are disarmed and 
you want to get back at your captor, what do you do? Well, they put you out to work and you, you work as slowly as possible. Um, you know, that's, that's the weapon that you have at your yeah, disposal absolutely. when you're, when you've been disempowered. So, um, yeah, well, you know, what you were saying earlier when you were talking about the colonial, you know, th these, these moments where violence kind of comes to a head and it happens, um, that, that's, I really appreciate that. I'm going to, I'm going to use that in my, my courses because, uh, teaching, colonialism um at georgia southern we do a, a world history class and we are what do we we're, we're supposed to go from roughly 1500 to present day and we got 15 weeks um and so wow. so it's wow. uh you know it's uh, all these questions that students have um you know it's what you just pointed out is is really valuable you know because colonialism isn't necessarily that people are are they're not in touch with their occupiers on a daily basis. It's it's just every once in a while, but those are really crucial moments that every once in a while is uh, those are, are are pivotal moments. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's a really good way to think about it for teaching for me because I struggle. Uh, there's so much out there that you've got to cover in, you know, in just a, 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 I mean, I'm ashamed to say it kind of comes down to a day or two when you, you yeah, talk no, about that. Well, uh, we all face those dilemmas, don't we? And it is yeah. so difficult. Um, and as you're saying, Brian, I mean, very often, I think colonial historians or global historians, as they often uh, call themselves these days, fixate on questions of encounter, those moments that you've just described, mm -hmm. because apart from anything, they're one of the few points at which the colonial majority becomes visible in yeah. the historical record, you know, um, We've all become, to a greater or lesser extent, cultural anthropologists, I think, in trying to reconstruct the lives of people who who are kind of systematically, they're not even written out of the colonial record. They're just not in it. Right. Um, yeah, they're invisible. Not on their own terms. And that, you know, that raises all kinds of methodological challenges of you know, how do you avoid replicating the, the, the voice of the people that you, you tend to be reading about and drawing upon it's 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 a real dilemma that we've all got i think yeah i find you know with my my students who don't have uh foreign language skills really it's it's challenging to find voices um you know of of i mean there are african voices uh you know there's chinua chebe there's stuff like that but outside of that it's hard to find accessible um, you know, voices for students other than than the European voices. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, better than anyone, um, you know, there's, there's definitely room for those translations, uh, so that they can, they can be given to American students who, who aren't going to be able to read it in anything but English. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all in that boat to some extent. And, yeah, think, me know, too. Uh, yeah, we're, yeah. we're not dissing American students, mind you, <laughs> we just, uh, you know, it's, it's a fact. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I think, you can almost flip the argument around as well insofar as I'm increasingly interested by those who, in a sense, are really trying to remain silent. Because it, in these sort of societies, and in, particularly in situations when there is an active conflict going on, you don't want to speak up. You don't want to be noticed. You don't yeah. want to be seen to be taking sides because that is a very dangerous proposition. And so how do you, in a sense, account historically for the, if you like, the silent middle, the people who, um, if you like, are pursuing a survival strategy that is predicated on saying what their listener in authority, whether that be a counterinsurgent or an insurgent, whether it be a, a colonial administrator or a village uh, headman, um, predicated on doing what they want to hear. So you will say utterly contradictory things. You will demonstrate different allegiances, multiple identities within the space of 24 hours. Yeah. Um, and one can find evidence of that. But does that really tell us what these people thought? You know, aren't they playing a kind of sophisticated game of survival? I'll just say, Martin, that sounds like my approach to surviving our history department. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's how you get through a department meeting, right? That's right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, look, let's take our little our little fake break, Brian. Okay. We'll do it. Right. 
So we, we talked a little bit in the first half about, about teaching global history and, um, you know, the prospect of, of doing research in global history or teaching global history is daunting for a lot of scholars because of the sheer amount of ground that has to be covered. Um, you know, not to mention the the language skills that you need. So what advice do you have for young scholars uh, as far as approaching doing global history? And what I mean by this is, you know, uh, obviously you can't do everything. So what themes have you found are almost universal? Um, how do you how do you compartmentalize? How do you kind of, of of make global history workable? And obviously, you've done a very good job. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I mean, I, I haven't got a magic bullet for you there, I'm afraid. No, 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 but yeah. <laughs> but uh, one of the, the kind of methodological breakthroughs, if you like, that global history claims to claims ownership of, which I think is perhaps a bit dubious, but, but I, I like what it's saying, is simply that you can't do things on your own, exactly as you've just described. There's too much to do. The work has to be inherently comparative. It's got to be multilingual, multi-regional, I think also actually multi-empire, multi-colonial. Um, all of which is a long-winded way of saying work with other people. Okay. I think the sooner one gets into the habit of saying, look, I know my limits. I can't do all this stuff. I've got a bit of this particular skill. This is what I can bring to the party, but let's work together. So my prediction in a way is that rather like in the sciences, uh, we will see many, many more multi-author papers and books and things over the years to come because as historians, we will perhaps move away from the idea that this is our domain. I'm a specialist in this. I'm going to write the definitive thing about this particular thing. And instead say, look, I can bring this perspective to a much bigger question. How did colonial violence or empire itself operate in a massive type question? Yeah. Um, but one that really takes an awful lot of people to answer, I think. So I think to a young academic, the sooner you join as many societies and groups and just get out there amongst your, your fellows, the better. Really. And, you know, I imagine we as a not only a profession, but the bureaucracies in which we work are going to have to make that adjustment. And, and just speaking from personal experience, I've been on a couple international grants. And, you know, when you've got the the primary investigator in Australia then you've got a, a guy in the United States, somebody else in England. The bureaucracy of of distributing money gets really, really, really complicated. But you know, you're necessarily going to have those kinds of relationships doing what you described, right? Yeah, yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, COVID clearly has been a revolution in in familiarizing us much more with kind of remote communication and things that people in other disciplines and other walks of life, I guess, have been doing much longer than we have but there's still a kind of vestigial lone scholar model of the yeah. perfect historian oh, yeah. who right. goes from, right. from archive to archive on this sort of Don Quixote <laughs> quest <laughs> um, well you know that, that's a terrific thing to do but in a way you know let's make our lives easier and just work together on things yeah. um, I think that's that's going to become more and more normal and um, and remember, even Don Quixote had Sancho Panza. So. That's right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Martin, uh, we felt like we should ask you about Ukraine. I mean, a, a little bit. Mm. I, I I think you might might have some insights to share because of you know what what you study. I mean, you you, you do a lot with counterinsurgency, asymmetric warfare. You know, of course you know, human rights, and, you know, we've got this conflict going on uh, now for over a year. And I don't know, what's, what's, what's your take on it from that, that perspective? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd preface any comments by, you know, um, just lamenting the sheer tragedy and, and the, <clears throat> the, the appalling nature of this conflict and, and the way it was started. We've had uh, we've been privileged to have some Ukrainian refugees living with us for a few months. 
And my sense is that the Ukrainian people have an immense capacity both to resist, but also to forgive what's been done to them. The sooner that we can get to a point in which those voices are heard, the better. But in terms of the the strategy and the, the, the nature of the conflict, well, I mean, coming back to the earlier point about global history, there, there are some who took, I suppose, what you could call the transnational turn, who, who very strongly reject the idea that history has to incorporate the state at some point. And interstate conflict is, in a sense, regarded as something vestigial, something of the past. Well, yeah, historically, it's of the past, but something that's less relevant to the 21st century. Well, Ukraine has rather exploded that. It's just like, guess what? Yeah. 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 Um, Here is an interstate conflict uh, that's pitched two very different states and two very different societies and two very different civil societies against one another. But boy, does it prove the relevance of the state and boy, does it prove the relevance of international interstate cooperation. I'm sure you guys and your listeners have been following just the sheer quantity of of devastation that is taking place um, and the perennial arguments and debates over supply and logistics and who's going to get what when. In many respects, it all adds to my sense that it's the political economy of the thing that is going to determine the outcome more Mm. than anything. It's the root and branch, hard stuff, of making technologies work for one side or the other, of supplying one side or the other more effectively, of valuing those who are being asked to give their lives um, and giving them the means uh, both to survive and their families to survive, all of which are fundamentally questions of political economy, questions of basic human supply and human need being satisfied. and in that respect, I mean, I don't see an end to this war anytime soon, but I don't yeah. think Ukraine is going to be defeated anytime soon either. I was going to say, it's just, you know, what I, I was I was thinking as, as you were speaking there is in so many ways how this, the, you know, the war in Ukraine is still a 20th century war. It's, uh, yeah. you know, it's a, it's despite all of the predictions about how war was going to be fought in the future. Um, yeah. This is it's still a 20th century war in, in most of the important ways. Yeah, absolutely. And a, and an attritional one. Yeah. You know, that's that's the horrifying thing, isn't it? There, yeah. There's a sense in which this has become, certainly over very recent weeks, a kind of artillery battle yeah. um, in which both sides are really trying to force the other into either submission or into some sort of um, decisive encounter a la Clausewitz. Yeah. Um, but the logic of that is just terrifying. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, with the Russians, it's just like you've got, you know, almost no strategic creativity mm-hmm. or operational creativity, it seems. It's just bludgeon. You yeah. Know, just feed, I'm, I'm... feed whatever they've got, you know, be they prisoners or contractors or conscript conscripts just feed them into this meat grinder yeah i mean the power of dissenting voices at some sort at some point i hope yeah. will make themselves felt uh, yeah. and i'm sure there are countless russian people who are just appalled by oh, yeah. what yeah. is being done in their name yeah. absolutely um, but until they get an opportunity to really express that i can't see this yeah. thing coming to an end yeah wow well on, on that happy note <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah no. sorry <laughs> no. no 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 we asked the question because we knew that you'd, you'd have a, a yeah. interesting take on it we, we appreciate appreciate that shall we get to some rapid fire let's do rapid fire <laughs> All right, because I know I know that's why he's here. This is what yeah, he cared about. Yeah. yeah, this is all he cared about. I, I want to be on that rapid fire thing. 
Okay, Martin, you've, you've listened to a few of these. Mm. Uh, we'll ask you a series of questions and give us your best answer as quick as you can. And, and remember that this is wow. our show, so we reserve the right to comment, comment. and judge. Yep. Yep. I'm yeah. feeling under pressure. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, Brian, go. All right. What are you reading for pleasure? Ah, now, well, the, the, do you want the honest answer? Yeah, not absolutely. A great, not a yeah, great deal. honest answer first, then you can make something <laughs> yeah. <up> later. <laughs> The, the slightly dishonest answer is that I have Bertolt Brecht's threepenny novel looking at me accusingly on my desk, which I've been <laughs> meaning to read for a very long time. But to say I'm reading it for pleasure is stretching reality. Yeah. All right. That counts. That counts. Um, what about the best history book that you've read recently? Oh, that's a good one. Um well, the most recent book that's made a huge impact on me, I mentioned to Brian a little while, oh, sorry, to Bill a little while ago, which is um, Salah Mohandassi's book called Red Internationalism, which has just come out, um, which is about kind of radical anti-war opposition to the Vietnam War mm -hmm. uh, and kind of multilateral efforts to coordinate opposition to Vietnam in, in France and America and within Vietnam itself. That's made quite a big impression on me. Um, I also read a very different book quite recently that I think is just tremendous by a, a historian called Alexander Morrison, and it's called The Russian Conquest of Central Asia. Um, a, a great deal of which is about camels and how camels do or don't survive in the winter. Really? Uh, yeah, the logistics of uh, camels. Um, but it's a tremendous book, a really, really superb. Okay, yeah, that sounds really, and very, very interesting. Exciting. You know, I'm always looking for stuff for my students because I'm always hammering logistics in my military history course. I just, you know, and, and of course, it's just the most unsexy thing to talk about because that's not what they expect. So I'm always looking for something that can grab them, you know, on and something like that actually might. Be yeah, camels is yeah, one of those get them. things. Yeah, I really recommend it. Um, yeah. It's also one of those books where you're so glad there are multiple maps in it because uh, you're forever going, or I'm forever going back and saying, oh, where's this plane? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Okay. You get to listen to one band or singer for the rest of your life. Who is it? A lot of candor. I think that have to be Little Feet, you know? Little Feet. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Early, okay, that's well, our... low little feet. Yeah, low era little feet. Yeah. 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 I mean, there are lots that's... of candidates, but oh, I do love little feet. Okay, I like that's, it. That is our first uh, little feet answer. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what, we've, we've had a big swing from Billy Joel to little feet. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> <on> our show. Because <laughs> we swore we'd hang it up when someone said Billy Joel and, and we, we uh, had that with, okay. with Alison Finkelstein. But she made a good case. Yeah, she did. Not that we concurred, but we accepted the the premise of, of her. Well, so, one of the nice things about Little Feet, I mean, we like with so many bands, there are all those complex genealogies, aren't there? I mean, you know, you've yeah. got links into the mothers, into the Grateful Dead. There's all, all these kind of great connections that I just love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I like it. I like it. All right, what are you binge watching? I am binge watching something called Paris Police 1905 at the moment. Uh, there was an earlier one called Paris Police 1899. They're both French um, kind of crime thrillers, really. Uh, but the first one was set right in the thick of the, the Dreyfus case. And, and then this uh -huh. one set uh, just a few years later. And they're, they're just tremendous. Oh, that sounds really yeah. interesting. Where, where yeah, does one, really good. What, really what, good. what bizarre random streaming service that I've never heard of are this on? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm pretty primitive with this stuff. I'm just watching it on the BBC. But, uh, oh, sure the good old BBC. Gary Lineker's favorite. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> all right. Um, tough question. Who has done a better job of coming to terms with its colonial past, Britain or France? Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, in a lot of respects, uh, I, I imagine people might imagine I would say Britain, but actually I think in some ways it's France because they've had more imminent issues to confront. I don't think 
to preface everything that either have done and especially it's done well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I think France is really trying, um, and Macron, whatever one thinks of him, um, has made some pretty landmark statements about changing the nature of France's relationship with the Francophone world more generally. Um, and it seems, I think, it, it will back up words with action. I think the British have got a long way to go before they'll do anything comparable. All right, coffee or tea? Tea. Tea. Actually. All right. Yeah. I didn't know if I didn't know if your your Frenchness had uh, had you know. <laughs> no, I'm pretty you hopeless. I'm, pretty yeah. I'm not keen on wine, and I'm not good with coffee. So <laughs> it's uh happy. it's always great when you go to a conference in the UK, and uh, there are a lot of Germans there because during the breaks, you know, you have every all the Germans going towards the coffee, and all the Brits are <laughs> over at the tea. <laughs> yeah, it's true, isn't it? Conference. Yeah. Conference cultures really express themselves in those yeah. breaks, don't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, and there's Brits, an edit. North American conferences, we're always just so impressed by the sheer scale of the, the snacks that are provided. <laughs> Bear claws <laughs> and that kind of thing. I was about to say, remember in Amsterdam, you know, the coffee break had a whole different meaning, right? You could go to the coffee shops down the street. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm saying nothing to you. <laughs> all right i know the answer to this but we need to discuss which football team do you support uh i support plymouth argyle football club which is having a very stellar season right number two in the table well one. number two in the table bit of a disaster 48 hours ago at barnsley we got yeah that was a little top. weird back to attritional warfare about a month ago we played another a, a team that's actually much bigger than us historically in the table called Bolton Wanderers on the edge mm -hmm. of Manchester um, and came away with a nil-nil draw away, which we were quite pleased about. But in the course of that, our keeper picked up a bad knee injury uh, and right. our emblematic uh, centre-back, Dan Scar, got uh, injured as well. Uh, and I think the captain, Joe Edwards, got sent off as well. So it we came away without a keeper and without the kind of midfield general, if you like. And yeah. uh, we're still struggling to adjust to that. Sure. Uh, and this is where, in the lower leagues, being a, a sort of big team that's fallen on hard times, like we were discussing before uh, we got into the podcast, Sheffield Wednesday, for example, an intrinsically yeah. quite large team that's in the same league as Plymouth at the moment, and then Plymouth, well, it's a team with a big hinterland, but um, we haven't got the capital resources behind us, the money. As soon as you get two or three injuries, you're in big trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have a lot of depth on the bench usually. Yeah, this yeah. Club, right. Um, you know, we're getting to it toward the end of the season, and and it's looking good. I would I would hope if they can hang, if they so. can stay up there, so they can don't, they don't have to mess with the playoff. Yeah, I really right. hope so. It'll be great for the Southwest if we can go up. And, yeah, get up to the championship. Uh, and, yeah, 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 it would be nice. That'd be good. That'd be good. Let me see what you s respond to this one with. Uh, we like to ask about movies every once in a while. So what do you think the best film on decolonization is? Ooh, well, I think the best... Some good is, ones. Yeah, there's a lot in the frame, aren't there, when you, when you think about it. But I, I don't think The Battle of Algiers has ever been bested really okay, uh, yeah. it's just an incredible film made you know barely three years after algerian independence in 62 so made over the summer of 65 into the autumn of 60 right. uh, sorry into the new year of 66 and that kind of false but very believable documentary style and some of the actual participants in the war in the film itself yasef saadi most famously Yep. Um, it's just an incredible film and avoids the obvious, you know, avoid sort of demonizing the French. It's, yeah. it's, it's much more effective in a way for, for being not understated, but measured in some ways. I think it's, mm. it's an incredible film. Yeah. Um, that holds up. Great soundtrack as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's a movie. It just came to me probably from the early 60s it's Attenborough can't remember who else is it but Attenborough plays the oh stereo, not guns at Battesi, not yes one. guns at Battesi. Yeah. Right? yeah 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 
Yeah. That's a good film. Yeah. Yeah. It's If a it's good like, film. you know, the, the Halcyon days you're hanging on and, Yeah. but the, the change is coming Yeah. and the, And the violence really is starting made to come. in the thick of the Congo crisis and Yeah. this whole idea Right. of a sort of anarchic space and, and, and Yeah. almost like the Alamo in a way, what happens Yeah. when you become Yeah. besieged? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is a good film. Yeah. Yeah. it's a good. I, I, I Have saw either that. of you guys seen All La Loi, Outlaw? Have you seen that? There No. would be I, I really recommend that it's, and, and use it with your students. You don't have to be working on, on Right. the French Empire. It's just an extraordinary film. came out in 2010 um, and caused a huge brouhaha in France because it, it begins with this reconstruction of the, the Setif massacre in 1945. Wow. And it's portrayed as a massacre and, and Yeah. uh, French audiences, including Jacques Chirac and his wife, who went to the premiere, made, made a really big stink about it and said, you know, wanted it banned and all this kind of thing. Yeah, Um, it doesn't fit okay. the narrative. Yeah. It doesn't Yeah. fit the narrative, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. All right, Brian, sorry. All right, number nine. What is your guilty pleasure? Uh, sailing, I guess. Real? Okay. Um, yeah. So going back to the youth once again. Yeah, A man yeah, of the sea. yeah. I like I like messing around in boats. Yeah, Well, you cool. would uh you would you would get along swimmingly with our old colleague John Bryant who how big did of a boat did he buy? He's Bill. got like a forty-five foot catamaran Oh my that word! yeah, Oh my word! that he's he's got he went he he upgraded. He had like a I don't know twenty-eight foot um, single master and, and but then Lovely. uh Yeah. yeah he's Yeah, I like anything that floats, really. But uh, yeah, I tend to sort of go around in little things and try and kick me out of them, you know, capsize me all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I love it. I bet that's relaxing too. It lets Yeah. you check out, right? It is, yeah. And uh, it's just nice when you're so close to the water, you know, actually to the, the sort of surface of the water. There's something about it. I just, oh, I adore it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Final question. Always the final question. Um, how much? First of all, how much time have you spent in the United States? Uh, well, not as much as I would have liked to. Uh, I've never been there uh, for an extended period of work, but Okay. my trips have tended to be uh, lots and lots of conferences. And I've also got some cousins over in California that uh, I, I like to go and see. I haven't seen them for a long time. But, uh, Okay. This, yeah. this, this question might be, might be a tough one, but we're going to, we're going to throw it out there. So, uh, Bill and I are both barbecue connoisseurs. Uh, he is, he is a Texan. I'm a South Carolinian. So I prefer pork barbecue. Bill likes the brisket. We both enjoy both kinds of barbecue, but, uh, you know, we, we have our preferences. So for you, do you prefer if you've had them, uh, brisket, which is beef or pork barbecue? Oh my word! I'm afraid I'm I, I'm out of my depth here, Yeah, but I that's think that's I'm okay. That's okay. I It's probably a head towards the beef, but man. uh, Okay. All right. <laughs> sorry about that. Bill's like Bill's like no, he's an expert. He likes beef. Yeah, he's He's an expert. He he's likes an expert. brisket. He likes brisket. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Do uh Fair does enough. do, are there are there any restaurants around you in the UK that even attempt to do barbecue? No. Okay. <laughs> Not Because where it has I a am. different meaning there, right? Yeah. I mean, it Yeah. almost Unless you first. barbecue a pasty. No, no, we're we're pretty uh we're pretty rudimentary in that field, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, Bill, if we ever want to, you know, find a way to live in Europe, I think we could open a barbecue place because it's one thing Yeah, I've noticed there's in Germany a big too, gap in the market. their, yeah, their attempts Yeah. at barbecue are, are, are not very good. So if we ever need to get a visa, work visa, you know, we could justifiably say that we are Yeah. offering a service that is not available. <laughs> You know, it's the same with Tex-Mex too. It's the same with, with Tex-Mex because I remember in London, the, 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 the Texas embassy, two guys from Dallas who did business in London a lot, they, they opened up a Tex-Mex Tex restaurant in London and it did really well for a long time, but, uh, but I don't think it survived COVID. It may have shut down before that, but um, Yeah. Well, I tell you, you've got some willing customers here. We, we're just waiting to be educated, I think. Yeah, you got All a right. good curry place near you, though, right? You got a We've good got curry a few place. of those. Yeah, Yeah, good. we've got a few of them. Yeah, That's and the they're one very thing good you've got too. on everybody else. I mean, Yeah. boy, just, yeah, good stuff. But, well, Martin, hey, thanks for, for taking the time. This was really delightful. Thank Enjoyed you. Thank it you tremendously. so much. Appreciate your, 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 
your take on all these things, especially the Ukrainian deal. Uh, yeah, but yeah. this was this was good and continued continued good success to to Plymouth Argyle. Uh, well, thanks, was, and to all your teams, Forest Green you. and. and all the Bundesliga teams as well. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a Bayern München guy. Um, oh, are you? Yeah, I mean, I'm making a bid for Harry Kane. I see. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, I learned German in Bavaria, so that's my, my claim to why I'm allowed to like them. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, do you ever run into uh, my, my friend uh, Matthias Reis? Um, at Exeter. I do. Okay. Yes, of well, course. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, we we co-edited vo a volume together. Uh, so please tell Matthias that Brian said hello. I will indeed. All right. Yeah. yeah, great. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Well, look, no, man, thank thanks. You, we appreciate look it. It's good to time. see you. Yeah, yeah I hope you to too. see you soon sometime. Cheers, guys. Folks, thanks for listening to this episode of Military Historians or People Too. Brian heads up the research department and our social media division, and Bill heads up production, editing, and music. We're not monetized, and we depend upon you, dear listener, to help us spread the word about this podcast. So tell your friends, share on social media, listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Overcast, and wherever the heck you get your podcast. If you need an idea for your class, make them listen to military historians of people too. Give them some extra credit. Thanks for listening.